Hello and welcome along to this online presentation of our 11th Annual Australian Market Update Seminar, this year entitled Living Life as a Financial Target. It's been a joy to present this for 11 years and uh, we try and keep all of our existing clients and potential clients informed of the changes that are going on in the market in regards to Australian property in particular, but the other influences affecting us. So without further ado, let's start moving into as always, we like to start off where we finished last year. It's all well and good for us to make predictions and uh, m market commentary, but if we don't have a level of accountability to see how we went, then it would be pointless. These are the four main areas that we cover each year, stock markets, currency, interest rates, Australian property. And you can see our predictions last year compared to what it actually re resulted in. In the stock market, when we started the seminar last year in November 16, the stock market was extremely volatile and on a downward spiral and people thought that was the next correction coming along. We didn't share that view, we were quite optimistic and we held the view that we thought the market would actually return to positive news and in fact over the year it did. It had a very strong year with double digit growth you know, and has now peaked up at new record highs. So that's an interesting you know, place that we are at now. With currency, again, the Australian dollar was very weak at the time of last year's seminar. And everyone was talking about it going sub 70 cents towards 65 and potentially even 60. We didn't share that view. We thought that the dollar was you know, a bit undervalued at that time and we felt that it would come back to 75 to 80 cent range. It bottomed out at 71 and a half actually and in fact peaked at 81 cents and now having come back to around that 80 cent and below 80 cent level where we thought we would see it. Interest rates, you know, we didn't think that the RBA would uh, reduce the rates further and they didn't. We thought they might increase them, but they didn't formally increase them. What they did, however, was allow the banks in Australia to increase their rates, particularly for investors. And that did the job for the RBA. They've also tightened the regulations even further on lending for people, particularly living overseas, but investors generally. And this probably is going to keep the RBA with a low rate focus for the, the coming time, as expected. Fixed rates we thought were very, very attractive, and they bulk of this year's seminar. Now, we, we entitled the seminar Living Life as a Financial Target because when you're living overseas as an Australian property owner or investor, the rules have changed so much in the last few years that we're certainly not being encouraged and at least you know, appreciated for the effort that we're putting in. You can see here there's a long list of changes that have affected foreign buyers, starting with the capital gains tax, which back in May 2012 you know, had our 50% tax-free concession removed for anyone living overseas, expatriates, foreign investors and the like. You know, that's, you know, um, remained in force despite our best efforts. We had a petition with 3,000 signatories strong to fight that and we just got ignored basically. Further to that, we've seen an introduction of withholding tax for anyone owning a property overseas. Now, this is not an additional tax. It currently sits at 12.5% of your sale proceeds if your property is sold when living overseas and it's worth more than 750000 Now, this is a withholding tax as opposed to a separate tax. It is only an in advance you know, amount held by the tax office until you lodge your tax return. If you feel your tax will actually be lower than that, you can re reduce the withholding tax to the actual amount or you can wait to lodge your tax return and then you would be refunded any difference more or less. You know, so bear in mind that is not an extra tax, it's just a, in advance. It's basically because they find that there's not enough trust with overseas buyers that if they do make a profit they might disappear and it may be too difficult to find them somewhere in the big wide world. A recent change um, has come about too that hasn't yet come into law 
but could be a significant change uh, to you know, expatriates living abroad. Initially, this was announced in the May 2017 budget as a change to foreign investors. Now, but it's gone much further, where now they're threatening that any Australian expatriate that's lived in a property in Australia prior to going overseas and would ordinarily be entitled to principal residence capital gains tax free status on his property may lose that you know, capital gains tax free if they are selling the property while living overseas. Furthermore, they're expanded that to include if you receive an inheritance of a property that is a principal residence of your parents, for example, in Australia when they pass away and transfer the property to you, if you are living overseas at the time, potentially that's going to become a taxable transfer rather than what was previously a tax-free transfer. These changes, we believe, are not government policy but poorly written legislation. And we have started another petition on this, which I'd encourage you to go to our website and join and sign up because we really need to fight this before it becomes another adoption of really, really poor legislation. We've also seen the introduction of the Federal Foreign Buyers Fee, which at SMATS we support. We actually encourage this and recommended this to the government in our submissions to the House of Representatives at the time. Um, it's a nominal amount of 5500 which on international scale is quite low. Now that was originally 5,000 has some, uh, since been lifted to 55, um, but is at a small token in what was a free transaction, but now is going into the coffers. This is important because it funds the government re um, foreign investment review board panel and other things, but it's a substantial revenue winner, as you'll see later. The states have also got into the act of charging foreigners additional cost of buying. You know, up until July 2015. If a foreigner, expatriate or local or foreign investor bought a property anywhere in Australia, they were treated exactly the same as anyone living in Australia at that time. That changed in July 2015 when Victoria was the first state government to introduce a foreign buyer's fee. Initially that was 3%, but it has now been lifted to 7% of the purchase price. Now where this has been doubly impacted in Victoria is Victoria also used to offer a concession if you bought what was called off plan. Now that is when you buy the property before construction commences. Now that gave a significant stamp duty saving from the traditional 6% cost down to at times around 1%, 2% of the purchase price. That concession has now been removed not just for foreign investors but also for any investor living in or out of Australia. The only people that will get the, uh, the uh, off-plan stamp duty concession now is if you're an owner-occupier moving into the property as your home. For foreigners, you'll now have to bear the full stamp duty cost of approximately 6% and an additional 7% cost. Now, importantly here, foreigner is anyone who does not hold an Australian citizenship or an Australian permanent resident visa holder. So if you are either of those, you do not pay the foreign buyer's fee, even if you're living overseas at the time of purchase. But if you are a foreigner, you will in fact be up for that charge. If you are the spouse, um, uh, buying as your spouse as a foreigner, you would pay it on the half purchase price. Victoria also increased their land tax cost. It used to be the same as the locals, but has been rising up rapidly, and now they've introduced a very aggressive your land tax regime. Not only is there an additional 1.5% levy on your unimproved value of the land, but there's also a starting threshold you know, of $3,000 plus you know, for anyone living abroad. Again, not including Australian citizens or permanent resident visa holders, but a big impost if anyone is a foreign investor buying a property in Australia. Where the land tax is particularly nasty is it captures all the previous purchases that bought not being aware that this cost may be in place. And so it's caught a lot of people unawares and it's caught a lot of people with trouble because there's a significant uplift in the price. New South Wales followed Victoria with bringing their, their own foreign buyer's fee you know, a year later in June 2016. And to quote them, they said, oh, Victoria did it and it didn't seem to make a difference, so we might as well do it. Now, they originally brought their fee in at 4%, but it's now currently 8%. Now, where this is doubly impact, of course, is in New South Wales. The price point of property is significantly higher than anywhere else in Australia. It is now the higher foreign buy, highest spot foreign buyer fee on the highest priced property. So 8% is a significant impost. 
Now, New South Wales is a little bit different to Victoria, where it does not charge that foreign buyer fee if you are an Australian citizen, but it does charge you if you are an Australian permanent resident visa holder, but have not been in Australia for more than six of the last 12 months. So even you know Australians that uh, granted PR status and then move overseas for work, they will be up for this foreign buyer fee, so they need to be very mindful of how this may impact. In the same way, the land tax has been increased by 0.75% since July 2017 for anyone living overseas. Again, does not apply to citizens, but does apply to permanent resident visa holders and foreign investors. You know, so you have to be mindful of that impact because the values, again, have snuck up quite a bit. Queensland also brought in their fee in October 2016 and currently at 3% and likely to rise sometime in the near future. You know, land tax in Queensland always was higher for what they called absentee, i.e. people living outside of Australia, but they have increased it even further with an additional impost of 1.5% you know, uh, since July 2017. So you can see all the states have got in the act there and made a big difference. WA was the last of the major states to bring in their foreign buyers fee. They've announced that it will be 4%, but it will not start until 1st of January 2019. For WA. You know, one of the reasons for that is the state property market there is still quite you know, sluggish and of course they want to incentivise people to act at the moment so they've delayed the introduction until they can get the economy moving a bit stronger. In terms of lending, lending used to be readily available for everybody, expatriates, foreign investors, all on the same terms, all on the same interest rate and it was a very sensible lending market in Australia because our property security is so strong. But in recent time, that has changed significantly. And for the last 12 to 18 months, the rules have changed so much that most foreign investors can no longer get a loan from any Australian source financier. There are still a few financiers overseas that are lending, but basically no lender in Australia, you know, is, no major lender in Australia is doing any finance. We've seen the introduction of a few opportunistic lenders at very, very high interest rates and very high fees. We don't recommend those. They're literally last resort lending, but that's pretty much all that's available now if you are a foreigner. Now, expatriates still have access to some good lending in from the Australian major banks, but are not as favourable a terms as they used to be. Furthermore, any investor in Australia living in or out of Australia is also now getting a premium on their, their borrowing, where before it was the same as owner-occupier rates. And finally, the HELP or HEX, you know, the university you know, fees that we pay, you know, they did not used to be recoverable from offshore earnings. So it was only if you were back in Australia earning Australian income that you would be up for your HEX repayments. They changed that in July 16, so now it includes anyone living overseas being forced to measure their HEX repayment, HELP repayment, against their offshore income as well. So if you're living overseas as an expatriate, studied in Australia and have some university cost, you'll now have to start repaying that once you start earning approximately forty to fifty thousand Australian dollars a year, which is the vast majority of most expatriates. So you can see many, many changes, many, many things targeted towards foreigners in particular. Now, you'd have to argue whether this is fair. It's certainly opportunistic. If we look at this graph, we can see that foreign investment in Australia has escalated sharply. In 2010, it was $6 billion nationally, and in 2016, it has lifted to $70 billion worth of investment. Now, some people think this to be a bad thing, too many foreign investors, but it's actually a good thing. You can see the New South Wales and Victorian states have benefited the most from that foreign investment, and it's made their economies particularly strong. Now, when you consider the job creation and the stamp duty and all the other collections, this is an important element of each economy and has taken New South Wales from being what was the worst economy in Australia to now the best economy in Australia. It's kept Victoria <coughs> very, very strong for a long period of time now without significant foreign investment. So this amount of investment should theoretically be rewarded and encouraged, but instead in Australia we're penalising them out of fear and opportunism. The argument of whether it's good or bad remains strong. And if we look here, this is the actual number of foreign activity. We see in 2016, there was 42,205 properties sold to foreigners across Australia. The bulk of those going to Chinese, 30,611 of them in fact. 
Now, a key reason for that was in 2009, the then Pro uh, Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, relaxed the foreign investment review guidelines, which uh, prohibited any developer selling more than 50% of any project to overseas investors. They had to sell max, uh, at least 50% locally, no more than 50% offshore. In truth, at that time, very few developers sold more than 10 to 15% of any project overseas, mainly because it was too expensive, too troublesome, too, too uh, difficult. With the change of those rules, we saw an influx of foreign developers, developers from Singapore, China, Hong Kong, that came in and said, hey, we can buy these sites in Australia, build what we want, sell them to our clients overseas, and they'll be happy. And that's why we've seen such a drastic escalation in sales in recent time. Shanghai companies are building Shanghai projects in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and selling them to their Shanghai clients. Now, because they're Shanghai projects, it usually means they're very small and they're quite expensive for their size. But when you take them to someone from Shanghai, it looks large and it looks cheap. So they think they're getting a bargain, even though in the local market, it's not considered to be ideal size and certainly not ideal price points. But they can afford it. They like it. There's other motivations, such as school uh, studies. For the children, you know, they, they like to have a for offshore investment. So we've seen it become very popular, hence why we've seen an escalation from 4,400 sales in 2010 to 42,000 sales. Now, again, people think this is pushing the market up, but they forget that foreigners can only buy brand new property. They cannot go to an auction and buy an established property. And there's this misconception in Australia that foreigners are pushing prices up because they see a Chinese-looking person going to an auction and buying it. What they forget is that that is not a Chinese investor. That is a new Australian migrant you know, of Chinese origin. And they can come in and buy anything they want. And that has certainly had an impact on market because new uh, migrants with a new level of capital can buy a lot stronger than the traditional Australian. You know, the foreign investors, ironically, are actually keeping prices down. By bringing 42,000 units of accommodation into the market, it's putting less pressure on the property market. It's putting less pressure on the rental pool. It's putting less pressure on the supply and hence keeping prices moderated rather than escalating even further had we not had this additional supply. All markets run on the rule of supply and demand. There is obviously strong demand in Australia, and without this supply to satisfy it, we would see prices escalate stronger. Now, what has made it difficult to see that is that a lot of this supply is not in the areas of demand. There is strong demand for larger housing, townhouses, bigger apartments, genuine living property, as we call it. But a lot of this supply is very small inner city apartments, you know, what we call stops, small, tall and overpriced. In the city, one bedrooms in particular, you know, too small on, on the 50 square metres or less for one bedroom, 65 or less for two bedrooms, and not what, what someone would want to live and own. And hence we've got this distortion where supply is being predict, uh, predominantly funded in items of less demand, and demand is not being satisfied because there's limited supply in that larger housing area, and hence it's an issue. If we look at that, it's evident from the, the housing. You can see there's about 25 to, to 30,000 properties a quarter built in housing across Australia. You know, and apartments have been a large portion of the growth in the softer grey. You can see it's gone from 15,000 a quarter up to about 30,000 a quarter as well. So we've now got this excess demand there, you know, in the housing, not being satisfied because less investment is going into it, and there's an extra supply in, in the apartments that's not fulfilling the demand points. There's also a myth that foreigners own lots of property in Australia, but believe it or not, the foreign ownership level in Australia is actually less than 2% of the entire market. There's a total of approximately 10 million properties in Australia, you know, of which only about 200,000 or so are owned by foreigners. This is obviously changing quickly with these latest numbers, but it's whether they're sustainable moving forward with all of these new imposts and, ch and charges that the states are levying on these investors. Surely they're going to discourage investment with these higher costs, so we have to be very, very uh, to give you an idea of what it means to the government you know, to have all this revenue, 
is in 2010, the total value of sales in, to foreigners was 6.2 billion, you know, and that's now lifted to 70 billion in 2016. In 2010, we didn't have a federal foreign buyer fee, so there was no revenue raised by the government. But the other big bonus to the governments when they um, sell a brand new house, which a foreigner has to buy, is that in the sale price is GST. So approximately, you know, six to eight percent of the property, you know, is actually pure revenue in GST. And that revenue all goes to states. So under Australian legislation, all GST collected goes to the state governments. So you can see in 2010, that was approximately $600 million worth of revenue to the states. Furthermore, back there they get the stamp duty on each transaction. So it was about $240 million. Now one of the reasons that's a bit lower is because Victoria was one of the dominant states and at that time they had that off-plan concession. So the stamp duty revenue on that is quite soft. So you can see on six billion of sales there was about 800 million dollars of government revenue. That's escalated through the years to when we look at 2016 that's now 6.4 billion dollars of GST and 2.68 billion dollars of stamp duty. So it's gone from 800 million to nine billion dollars worth of revenue. Now the federal foreign buyers fee came into play in 2016 and you can see that's generated 200 million dollars worth of revenue for the government. That's very very attractive and that funds the entire foreign investment review board panel which has been strengthened up and given additional powers. Now you can see in 2016 was the first year also that we had the state foreign buyers fees and that was only in Victoria. So you can see that raised in that year $840 million of additional levy. Bear in mind that in 2016, Victoria still had the off-plan concession. Now to give you some perspective, if we ran the current situation, the 2017 numbers you know, on the current fees, the total from the foreign buyers fee would have lifted from $840 million to 4.27 billion across Australia. And that's because it's been increased in all states and it's now in New South Wales, Victoria and also Queensland. So you can see $4 billion a year is coming just from the foreign buyers fee on top of the GST and the state stamp duty, which is huge, huge money. Now again, this is also fueling that activity, that construction activity is fueling lots of indirect revenue because the governments are getting indirect revenue from income tax federally, profits tax, the job creation is huge and all of the different services that feed into the economy, property management, insurance, supply of white goods, it's a phenomenal spin-off that all this level of activity happens. So the importance of this foreign investor activity is not to be underestimated. Normally, if you saw this amount of new increase, you would thank them with some sort of encouragement. But no, in Australia, we've gone the opposite. We've you know, been opportunistic and we've just said, great, while you're here, we're just going to get you. And this doesn't even include the new land tax revenues, which again are also going to be multi-billion dollar revenues. The big question you have to ask yourself is, where is the money going? You, know, you can see a massive escalation in revenue but I'm not sure we've seen a massive escalation in expenditure in property related or support services like roads, infrastructures, etc. So it's a very interesting thing. I would like to tell you that all these things could be reversed, that these higher costs, we could see them disappear sometime soon, that it would be lovely that the governments will finally wake up and encourage foreigners instead of you know, trying to you know, exploit them. But I do not see that to be the case. I think they're addicted to the revenue and this is now the new norm. We will likely never see a reversal of these trends unless the property markets become so, so quiet that it will you know, uh, ne be ne necessary. Now, having said that, we have to be aware of what's going on and we have to learn to adapt our thinking to survive in this new environment. So I'm going to give you a few survival tips to do that. And the first one is awareness. It's very, very important to start there. And the first thing about awareness is understanding that finance is a very different animal than it used to be. 
it was at a time just recently, 12 to 18 months ago, that if you wanted to buy a property in Australia as a foreigner, as an expatriate, as anyone, that as long as you had a reasonable amount of income and you had a deposit, that you would very, very much likely get a job, a, a loan, 99% assured. However, that's changed. Foreigners now can't get lending, you know, and expatriates get a lot less than they used to be able to be approved for. The banks have changed their servicing guidelines, their method of calculation, everything's different. So you cannot assume that you will get a loan. It is now more than ever essential that you come and talk to someone like SMATS to get a pre-approval before you go shopping. If you're not sure that you can get a loan, then don't go looking for a property. It is critical you get assessed to see what you can afford. You don't want to go out and sign a contract and pay a deposit that may not be refundable if you find out later that you cannot get a loan approved. You know, it puts you at great financial risk. In the same way, you don't want to go and look for a property and get your hopes up that you think you're going to be able to buy only to be told that it's out of your budget and crush your dreams. So please make sure you check your finance first. You also have to be very aware of these new government policies. Luckily, I've just explained them to you. But if you are not Australian permanent resident or citizen, you need to be aware that there may be an additional 3 to 8% purchase price. Have you factored that into your budget? You need to be aware of the land tax changes because they're going to affect your cash flows. It's critical that you keep abreast of that and hence we'll keep you up to date with these seminars and uh, updates on our website and also newsletters. You need to make sure that the market is strong enough to support the recovery of these imposts. If you are having an extra land tax every year or you are having an extra entry cost of your property, you have to have enough confidence that the market will be strong enough to recover that cost or support that cost in some way. If not, you have to question your decision to invest and maybe look at other alternatives. You know, it's critical. We'll cover the market a bit later in this seminar. And these supply and demand factors that I mentioned are essential for you to be aware of. You want to be buying in the areas of strongest demand and avoiding the areas of you know, biggest supply. Oversupply leads to price fall. Strong demand holds and lifts prices. You know, we call it livability. It's essential that you satisfy the livable market, the market that people want to live in houses, larger size, extra bedrooms, better locations, outlooks, all these sorts of things. And don't underestimate the power of migration. That's what people are getting nervous on in Australia. When they see those Chinese looking buyers at those auctions, they are new Australians, they're migrants. And we forget that property of the rest of the world is extremely expensive. For instance, a, a small apartment in Hong Kong can be worth two to three million Australian dollars. And it's absolutely awful, 60 square meters, no view, not very nice uh, outside, but it's still worth three million Australian dollars. So if someone migrates from Hong Kong to Australia and sells their property and has three million dollars to spend, they're going to get a lovely property in any state of Australia and likely have change left over, certainly if they buy like for like. So you want to be in places that those migrants are going to want to buy. And they're coming mainly with, with families, as you'll see later. And also, don't in, underestimate the power of the future of inheritance and wealth transfer in Australia. It's still the sleeping giant that's waiting to come through. We haven't seen the massive impact yet. But, you know, as this older generation starts passing away, with a reasonable amount of wealth now, it will go to their, their children and be split amongst them with already high incomes and high lifestyles and then change the market once again. You know, this to me will be the biggest impact in the future 10 years as we see prices in highly sought after areas escalate even further as people are given free chunks of capital. What's also very interesting is we're seeing wealth transfer, i.e. inheritance during a person's life happening more and more. It used to be you had to wait till your parents passed away before you could get any sum of money from them. Largely because they used to consider that they didn't have enough to get through to the end of their life. 
now many parents are comfortable enough or confident enough that they think they've got more than enough money to get through to the end of their life so helping their children becomes a priority and that's helping them with deposits which we're seeing more and more with first home buyers in particular getting their deposits from their parents so don't underestimate the impact of that you know it's going to have a huge bearing in the ne next few years selection is probably the most important you know there's a misconception that any property makes money and that simply is not true good property grows in value bad property stagnates and falls so it's critical you get the best property you can you know you need to start with why are you buying this property is it because you are going to live in it is it for investment you know if you are going to live in it then obviously it's a personal choice location size type all these things but if it's investment you've got to be trying to assess how you're going to get the best return you might need to go out of areas you were comfortable with and out of types that you're comfortable with to meet your budget etc and you very much got to consider how are you going to sell that property and who to you know it's necessary that you have a property that is going to be desirable to people that have money not don't have money limited budgets have limited capacity to pay you profit so be clear as how you're going to get out is it short term long term because if it's a short term investment property is likely not the best place for you as the because the costs of going in and out can be quite high you know you've got to go to that livability that i mentioned earlier it is so so important you know the more livable a property is the more desirable it is the more desirable the more profitable you know, it's just critical that your property has something special, whether it's a nice kitchen, a great location, a view, size, a backyard, you know, close to transport, close to work, whatever it is, the more livable reasons you can find on a property to, to own, the more likelihood of your success, because that's the high demand area. You need to avoid those stops, small, tall and overpriced. Try and be in projects of less than 30 um, floors. Try being any property, if it's a one better, more than 50 square meters at least. If it's a two better, at least 65 square meters or more. Avoid the small stuff. Easy to rent, very hard to sell, almost impossible to make money on. And you've got to look out for what we call avalanche zones. There are many of projects in particularly Melbourne and Sydney to a lesser extent that have been almost 100% sold to foreigners who are now struggling to get finance and also are feeling quite aggrieved because they're finding out they were misrepresented. Many foreigners were told, hey, you probably won't even have to settle this. We'll flip it for you before it's completed. And that's an unlikely occurrence in Australia. It's not the way our market works. And even so, the stamp duty costs on that are so high that it doesn't warrant it. So a lot of foreigners are walking away from the sale through lack of finance and disappointment in price expectation. If that's happening too often, then the price is likely to collapse even further than normal market conditions. So you don't want to be in one of those buildings that is heavily sold to foreigners. And even when the price comes down, you'll still find it, I think, an unwilling purchaser. You know, that if you went and saw these properties, even you would say, wow, this might be cheap, but it's not nice and I don't want to live here. I don't want to own it. So be very careful of buying in those. You want to try and get the most out of your growth. And the best way to do that has always traditionally been by exploiting cycles. Sydney is a great property market. It always has been. But Sydney now is probably a little bit high to look at as an investment. It's at the end of its growth cycle. It's experienced most of its growth. Ironically, four or five years ago, that was the best time to buy Sydney. And everyone was saying, oh, don't buy because it was a bad time in the cycle. But the bad time in the cycle is always the best time to buy property. When people are most miserable, there's usually most opportunity. So somewhere like Perth right now is probably the most miserable market in Australia. That offers the most opportunity, I think, because it's more likely to recover, where Sydney, being strong now, is more likely to slow down. We'll talk about that a bit later. But don't be afraid to go out of your natural area into the area of most opportunity. That's how you can really push your profits up quickly. And you also should always consider having properties in multiple states. Now, I've always believed in this because I do follow 
the market cycles and usually there's one state that's very opportunistic another state that's very risky so i'm always going to the opportunistic buy but it's even more highlighted by the things like land tax now now land tax is a state-based tax and it's getting more and more expensive and the more properties you have in each state the higher that land tax can be and to the point where some properties where there's a really good bit of land and a very poor quality property built upon it, sometimes a land tax can be half or more of the rent that's collected each year. Now, if you want to keep the land tax to a minimum, the best way to do it is to buy a property in each state because in each state you get a new tax-free threshold and therefore you could have almost one property in each state and pay perhaps no land tax, where if you had three or four properties in one state, your land tax bill would be very, very high. So not only does it diversify your risk, create the opportunity for the market, but it significantly could lower your cost, so you should consider it. It's always made me chuckle that so many of our clients only ever buy in the state that they grew in up, you know, because they just they know it, they feel comfortable, but it comes at a great cost sometimes to be in just one state. Tip number three is efficiency. You now obviously like my friend here with the light bulb, you know, we haven't got the same old expensive power bulbs in our houses. We've changed those. You need to make sure that whatever you've got, that it's as efficient as possible. And the first one that you have is your largest cost, which is interest. You need to be sure that your interest cost is the lowest it can be. So get a review, check your loan is there. Even though there's less options at the moment, there still are good choices with the bank you've got. And that's where things like fixed interest rates could be quite attractive. You want to consider those, but make sure you review those. Give us a call if you need it. The tax is very important now because it's changed so much. As I say, foreign investors in particular have lost their 50% capital gains tax free. So we need to supplement the reduction with better tax planning. You need to have clear strategies to how you're going to keep your tax to the legally least amount. So, you know, we help you with that and happy to help you anytime. And your ownership costs, you know, need to be controlled wherever possible. Now, things like, for instance, maintenance, you know, it's best to do maintenance on a regular basis rather than wait for something catastrophic to happen. There's so many owners that we talk to that don't want to spend two or $300 to get something fixed and then all of a sudden the ceiling falls in and it's a few thousand dollars to fix. You know, be sensible with your costs. You know, the things that you can control, such as property management fees, etc., make sure you're getting the best deal. And, you know, we offer very efficient property management services throughout Australia, so contact us and compare a quote and see how you go. If you've got surplus equity in your property, to be efficient, you need to exploit that equity. You can't any longer justify leaving it idle. You know, if you've got some equity, having two or three properties using each other's equity to leverage up can boost your returns by you know, 20, 30% over and above what you'd normally get. It's very, very important you take advantage of that. And having multiple properties can also be a huge advantage for you because it again spreads your risk and increases your opportunity, particularly if you can take advantage of you know, opportunistic markets. But having one property means that you're stuck in the one asset. And if you ever want to sell it, the only one property you've got is gone and then no future opportunity exists. If you can get lucky enough to get two, three, four properties, you should multiply your returns, you should increase your flexibility and also reduce your risk through diversification. So it's highly recommended you look out there. And always try and get the best entry value and that's really about exploiting those markets. Get into markets that are in disarray, concerned, and worried because that's where you get discounts and value. I love to take advantage if I see someone getting divorced or if it's a deceased estate, you know, there's a good chance that you might get a little bit better price with all that misery going on. So take advantage of that. So seek out the best value you can find. And the last tip is togetherness. One of the big issues that we're seeing and why as foreign investors in particular we're being tackled so much is that there's no uniformity. We don't have a common voice as foreign investors. We're all fragmented and we don't have any way to voice our opinions and say, hey, you guys are taking advantage, stop it. You know, we need to get that sorted. We need to you know, stand together as a unit and you know, help with government policy before they keep changing it on us. And we need a very strong message 
Now, I can tell you the wrong message would be we don't want to pay this or we think it's unfair because no one in Australia thinks that foreign investors deserve a break. They keep saying, hey, good idea, get them to pay more instead of us. But we need to have a message saying, hey, that $9 billion of extra revenue that you've got, what did you do with it? If we can't stop them from taking it, then we better make sure that they spend as much of it on us and the property market to strengthen our position and reduce our risk as humanly possible. So it's important to have the right messages going. And we need to be there regularly fighting you know, any of these changes before they occur. You'd be glad to know we've finished with the general section. And we're now going to move into the specifics. And we're going to look at stock markets. You know, in the last year, we were seeing the stock markets in disarray you know, as the seminar began. But we weren't worried about that. You know, Trump was coming in as, as president. He had just won the election, which we did predict in our seminar, unfortunately. But, you know, you can see what has happened is since he has got in there, the markets have rallied. Now, he very gleefully has taken credit for all of the uplift. And in fact, I heard him say that he had paid off all of America's debt through the increase of the stock market. It's a false claim, but it has resonance. The main reason the markets have gone up is because there is no regulatory power in the White House. There's no one trying to protect the average guy so financial markets can go run amok. We've now seen the Dow hit record highs and continuing to push new boundaries all the time. Now, it's probably been stronger than it needed to, but to me, that certainly means that there's some danger. You know, by going up so quickly, it means that the fundamentals have also quickly weakened. Last year, we were brave enough to predict the stock market would do well, but that was because the price points and the fundamentals were strong. You know, value was there. This year, with the price lifting so high, it's the reverse. And we're now in gravity-defying area where it can't go up this strong for very much longer, we don't think. You know, the key element of that is yields and, and values. We just see that they're out of kilter. You know, there's no supporting evidence to support the growth that these stocks have been done. And the valuations are off the charts. You know, Microsoft is now worth well in excess of $500 billion dollars. It's just a mind-boggling number. You know, Apple, all these companies, if you check the market capitalization, they're scary. Now, do we think that there's a crash coming? I don't think there is a crash coming, but I do think we are going to be in for a, a very, very bumpy ride, and we're going to see significant rises and falls as a lot of manipulation goes in. One of the reasons I don't think we need, we'll see a crash is because the market is taking 3 to 4% swings on a fairly regular basis instead of a big 10, 20, 30, 40% fall. There's also no key driver to promote a crash talk. The economies are in reasonable shape. Apart from the US government deficit being so strong, everything seems to be falling roughly in place. To give you an idea of what the year looked like, you can see here over the last 12 months, the market in the US has rallied 23.5%. That's a huge uplift. And you can see since November when Trump got elected, it's been basically all up. But we have had volatility. There have been ups and down swings. But generally speaking, a 23% lift is significant. The Australian market grew only 4% in the same time. And the UK 
grew 7%, which is surprising considering how much they've been doomsdaying everything with the Brexit, etc. Now, ironically, though, if you look at it in reality, the US dollar has actually weakened by about 10% over the year. The Aussie dollar strengthened 10%. So even though the US went up 23 and the Aussie only did 4, 23 minus 10 is about 13-14%. 4 plus 10 appreciation on the currency is 14%. So ironically, the US and the Aussie did about the same. But numerically, the US powered ahead. Probably the most important thing, however, is if you look at the green and red coloured graph below, and this is the thing that worries me the most, Traditionally, the volume has always been at those levels of September, November, December. But you can see the volumes of trade in the stock markets have increased two to three times. Now, that is particularly worrying. That's not necessarily new money coming into the market. It's the rotation of money to make profit. And that's why I'm very worried about these levels of stock market, particularly on the Dow, which is a very aggressive market. I'm particularly worried that it's more trade profit driven rather than you know, genuine strength of market driven. To show that, here's a quick graph over the last 20 odd years. And you can see we've, we've had two big you know, pro, um, market crashes. You know, in 2000, uh, we, we saw a big fall from about 300 index to 200. In 2007, 2008, we went from 350 index down to about the 180. Now you can see since the 2007 global financial crisis, we've seen a significant rise from about that 180 point up to over 500 points on the index. But it says that we're probably in rarefied air. We've got 10 years now of generally positive growth. There certainly is a likelihood that I think the markets are going to see some sort of you know, correction of some sorts. I don't think we're going to see the crashes of the past, but I think we're going to see a different type of trading and we're going to see some very odd numbers in the very near future. I would be looking to maybe take some profits if I was particularly invested in the US. The reason for that is if we look at the two key elements, which are PE ratios, which is price to earnings, how much of a multiple of the earnings is a company's market cap, and dividend yields. We can see here that before the last crash, the PE had headed towards that 18, 19 level, and then it fell quickly with value, but you can see now is back up at that 18, 19 average market multiple. And that's very, very high. You know, so we're starting to get too optimistic in values. In the same way, if we look at yields, yields, you know, um, you know, were sitting there at around about that four percent. They start to get a bit tight in the U.S. and uh, in Australia, and then two percent in the U U.S. Now, when the yield is too low, it's also an indicator that the price is too high. So we can see it's starting to get back towards those danger points. And that, to me, suggests that we're in for not so much a crash, but we're probably up for a correction in the not-too-distant future. So again, be mindful, double-check what you've got. Be in stocks that you feel are value-conscious, value high-yielding. Those sorts of stocks are probably safer than the norm. But be very, very careful if the pro pro uh, company you're investing in particularly is not profitable and particularly is going through a lot of capital. These are the companies we put up every year. They're not a recommendation by any means. They're just you know, to give you an idea of how things move. And you can see in 2017, BHP went up a staggering 43% after going down in 2015, 40% and t down in 2016, 15%. Now, you can see a lot of that recovery was, in fact, just price recovery. It was, you know, an overcorrected downwards is now probably overcorrected back upwards too quickly. But is justifiable purely insofar as its, you know, um, normalization. Now, you can see the profit had fallen in 2015 from 13.8 down to $6.4 billion after tax in 2017. But 17 was a good result lifting up from the 4.4. So you could justify a level of increase, but I'm not sure you could justify 43%. HSBC, its profit went down from 17.7 and 16 to 5.1, yet its share price went up 25%. And this is an example of the change in fundamentals. You know, we're seeing a reduction in profit, but a significant rise in value. That doesn't really correlate to a logical thinking person. Bank of America had a small up increase in profit, but a massive increase in, in value. 
CBA in Australia, its profit went up quite nicely, but its share price only went up 3.3. Now, largely because you know, it had been up higher than that, but it did get caught out recently for a little bit of regulatory issues, so it's got some problems there. But it's still you know, it's paying a nice 5% a year, and it's probably relatively good value. Microsoft has gone up 30% in each of the last two years, and that's phenomenal. Now, there's argument that that's because of its change in revenue from selling to subscription, but whether it justifies 30% increase in, in price when its profit went up $5 billion, I'm not so sure. And when you consider it's made $20 billion profit after tax, but its market cap is over $500 billion, I'm not sure that those numbers stack up. Pfizer, 7.2, just a $200 million increase in profit, but no increase in price. And Coke dropped its profit, went up. And you can see the point I'm making with all these is there's no real pattern. You know, things just happen because they happen. And it's because the markets are driven by traders, by opportunistics. You know, it's the way it is. If we look at the overall, there's the Dow, 20% increase from the 9th of September 2016 to the 9th of September 2017. That's phenomenal, on top of an 11%. And again, we predict that. We said it would have a strong year. That's certainly better than I thought. I thought it would be about 10%. It was 20 And that perhaps says that a market is overcooked now. So just be mindful that there could be some sorts of corrections in the not-distant future. The All Ordinaries in Australia went up 55 probably underperformed, and I think there's some value to be had in that market in particular. And the FTSE did 9%, again, despite all the doomsdays. So first prediction of the seminar for next year, I think the Dow is up for a correction sometime soon. I think it's going to have a low to no growth year. I think we're going to see high volatility. I think we could see a little bit of a correction once or twice throughout the year to take out any gains that occur during the year. The all ordinaries, I think, is still relatively good value, so I'm still confident it can do a 5% plus growth. And the FTSE, I think, will kick in around 5% too. I don't think Brexit is an issue you know, as much as it's made out to be, so we'll see what happens. So there's our prediction. Moving into currency, you know, I think the Aussie dollar may have peaked. You know, it hit 80 cents, which is probably a high point. You know, and it's now come back to sub 80 cents, which is a bit n more normal. Now, I'm going to stay in my prediction of 75 to 80 cents. I think that's good value, and I think we should stay there. One of the things that uh, does worry me significantly, though, is the U.S. tax cuts. Now, if they get through, I think that could be very detrimental to the U.S. dollar. And the main reason I say that is to have such a significant cut in corporate revenue you know, at a time when your budget is already in financial disarray, is too quick, too much, and too too soon. And when you are running huge deficits with massive multi-trillion dollar loans, I don't see how you can drop your revenue. The other thing that worries me is that the argument is that it'll be stimulus, it'll boost the economy. Well, that may have been the case in the old days. If you had given tax cuts in the old days, back in the 80s and 90s, companies would take those tax cuts, invest in equipment, grow their businesses, seek out new markets. But we've seen time and time again in the modern world, these companies have already billions of dollars of cash reserves. And instead of investing that money and growing their businesses, they're quite happy to hold on to them. I think any tax cut could be detrimental because I think it's more likely that those tax savings will be used to further encourage acquisitions of competitors and that usually means to job cuts. You know, time and time again you hear so-and-so merges with so-and-so, so-and-so buys out so-and-so, then the next thing you hear is 2,000 jobs will be cut, 3,000 jobs will be cut, efficiency gains, etc., etc. That, to me, is my biggest concern. So I think the U.S. tax cuts could have a detrimental effect on the U.S. dollar and strengthen the Aussie. You know, obviously, with commodities stabilising around the world, that's helped the Australian dollar, which is a strong commodity you know, currency. You know, but we're still seeing quite a lot of volatility. You know, but I do think it's going to tighten up its range. You know, it's still that 75 to 80 cents. But we do have to watch for the wild cards, which are things like North Korea, Syria. There's some definite conflict points around the world that can have impact on currencies that we just need to keep a, a mindful eye. I don't think we're going to see too much escalation of physical activity you know, in somewhere like North Korea, but we're certainly going to see a lot of political...
if we look at the dollar you can see it started the year at around about that 75 cents it dropped down to 71 and a half you know and then it peaked back up over 80 cents and is now sitting at around about that 78 cents i'm going to go on as my second prediction of the evening with the currency to say i think the aussie dollar will stay in that 75 to 80 cent you know general range I'm comfortable with it at that level. The US tax cuts could push it up higher to be at the higher end of the 80 cents range, but it's going to be very interesting. You know, in terms of interest rates, you can see, strangely enough, again, if you look at the economics, normally if a country increases its interest rates, it strengthens their currency. But in the US last year, they increased interest rates from what was 0 to 0.25 up to over 1% now. Now, that should have had a positive impact on the US dollar, but the dollar has still slided. One of the reasons for that is I think the other fundamentals are so weak, but also I don't think there's enough of an increase when you're going from a zero base to 1% to encourage markets that much. It's going to be interesting to see if further interest rates occur in the US, but it's one of the great scams. You know, poor investors, you know, that are cash-based investors, retirees, etc., getting very, very little on their capital, while stock markets are going crazy. In the Australian market, you can see the cash rate has remained flat. It hasn't changed now for all, over 18 months. But if you look at the purple line, the actual rate on outstanding loans has actually increased. And the reason for that is that the government has been happy to allow banks to increase interest rates, particularly for investors and also for foreign investors. So the RBA doesn't need to put rates up because the banks are doing it for them. I think that trend is going to stay in place. You know, perhaps part of the reason that we had a bank levy come into Australia because that gets some of that money back. And if you look at CPI inflation, you know, that's staying in that, you know, 2 to 3% range that the RBA is happy. So there's no real reason for them to put rates up. So I'm going to predict that the RBA leaves rates as they are for at least the next 12 months or so. I think fixed rates are going to become very attractive because there is now an investor premium and there also is a principal and interest slash versus interest only premium. So you're now cheaper to pay off some of your loan than just pay interest. In the old days, we'd always recommend people, particularly investors, to always go interest only on their loans. But that was because interest rates were the same whether you paid it off or not. Now you get a discounted rate if you go principal and interest, whereas you're paying a higher premium if you go interest only. In many cases, the difference between that is negligible. So the discount you know, is almost enough to cover the full principal repayment. So principal and interest is certainly well worth, well worth considering now you know, in that market. So prediction number three, interest rates, I believe, will stay pretty much the same in Australia. Lending will still be difficult, though. In terms of population, it's the key element of property growth. I've always said that without property growth, you can't get, you know, pop, um, without population growth, you can't get property growth. And this is very evident if you look at particularly New South Wales and Victoria. You know, the reason why New South Wales has been doing so well in recent times is its population growth is now at record high at 116,000 a year. That's up from 103,000 in, in 14, but used to be sitting around 80, 85,000 a year. So that's a significant rise in a market that doesn't have a heck of a lot of supply areas. So that's why we've seen premium property close to the city escalate in price much quicker than normal. And Victoria, even stronger, it's gone from 100,000 to 146,000. It's increased from 110 last year to 146,000. That's a huge increase in a short period of time. And luckily for them, because they've got all those apartments that they need to, to fill. So that's been helping the market out. But there's still an acute lack of supply of high quality livable property. So it's propping the market up. It's you know, strengthening the economy. But you've still got to fix that gap. You've got to make sure that the delivery of supply is for the general market. You know, Queensland is finally starting to increase its population growth. Ironically, prior to 2014, Queensland used to be the highest quantum growth market in Australia at over 100, 105,000 a year and dropped down as low as 60,000 a year. It's now crept up for the first time positively to 70,000 last year. A large portion of that is the fact that they used to receive a lot of New South Wales and Victorians selling out and heading up north for retirement and warmer weather. That stopped for a while, largely because the New South Wales market in particular was doing so well. Everyone said, oh, we'll wait one year and get more money for the sale of our house and then go. 
Oh, get there. Oh, let's wait one more year, one more year. Now, for the first time, people are thinking maybe next year's growth in Sydney won't be so good, so we might as well sell now and then go. And I think you're going to see a large influx of southern state you know, uh, migration heading up to Queensland and potentially West Australia and South Australia, but predominantly Queensland, and that's going to have a massive positive effect on that market in the very, very near future. South Australia continues to kick on, and WA, you can see it bottomed out now at 16,800 population growth. That's the lowest it's ever been. At one point, WA was growing at 3.2% population growth, 60, 70,000 people a year. So it's dropped off significantly. But I think this is about to turn because a lot of that was because they had a lot of expats come in for the mining construction boom. Those people have been leaving. So we've had a steady population growth of 30 or 40,000 base, but we had 20,000 people leave that were expats from the past. They're going to now run out of that reduction and we're going to go back to our stable st um, steady growth and things are starting to improve in WA already. You can see Tasmania, its population growth has doubled to 3,000 people a year and wait till you see what that did for the property market there. Importantly, for the first time in a long time, we're seeing the overall trend in population start to rise again. The last few years, I've been warning people to be careful when they're buying property because the population was not growing as fast as it used to. It was slowing down. And you can see in this graph here, the trend line in the red was downwards. But we're finally seeing that trend line now turning and starting to head back towards increasing population across Australia. That's certainly going to help property investors, particularly if you're in that livable supply. Now, importantly, over half of this population growth is still under 14 years old. Natural births is half. Under 14-year-old migration is, is about another 10%. So 60% of the population growth is 14 years or less. And that's why I always say to people, look, get that extra bedroom, get that house, get that townhouse, get that larger apartment that a family could live in because that's the dominant growth in the market. Be very, very key towards that and it'll be very profitable. Again, world's most livable city. I put this slide up every year and it hardly ever changes. Melbourne, once more, is the world's most livable city and has been now for the last seven years. Importantly, I, I went to Vienna this year to have a look and Vienna, I must tell you, is absolutely fantastic. I found it very hard to understand initially why Vienna would not be a nicer city than Melbourne. But the key was I looked at, walked around Vienna at length and the city itself is amazing but once you get to the fringe of the city, it starts to de deteriorate quite quickly. And that was the thing that just dawned on me, that Australia has amazing all the way through to suburbia. Great cities, nice suburbs, great schools, great facilities. We're great all the way through from the best to the worst. And that's what makes Australia so powerful. So this is interesting that Melbourne keeps being number one. It's unbelievable free advertising and hence why, no surprise, Melbourne has the highest population growth in Australia. That publicity pays off with migration. Property markets around the world have been doing pretty well. Even Hong Kong, you can see, had a phenomenal year this year, 21% rebound. That's huge, especially when you consider how high the value of Hong Kong property is. Now, this is probably one of the key elements where you do hear in the Australian property market, when they're talking about all these foreign buyers, these Chinese buyers in particular, saying, well, how will they get the money out of China, etc.? Many of them got their money out of China many years ago by buying Hong Kong properties. And you can see the, the values of Hong Kong properties have been amazing performers over the last seven years. 24% in 2010, 25 and 11, 18 and 13, 20% in 15 and 22% last year. So don't underestimate how many people have the money already out of China and how many Honkies and Singaporeans and all the rest that are loving Australia, that have visas, that come down and meet, you know, join their families down there. It's phenomenal. The main thing I want to show you here is that all markets are pretty much in the black. Singapore and Thailand didn't do too well. There's small um, losses there. But everywhere else is doing okay. And that's just a good thing for sentiment. Everyone's happy around the world and the markets generally are okay. In terms of Australia, you can see our GDP is still pretty decent. You know, we're now the record holder. We're the longest ever country 
to go without a recession. No one's ever gone as long as, as we have without a recession. And that's despite all of the chaos. If you've been following Australian politics, you know we've got a big scandal going on now with the, the citizenship crisis where federal members have got dual citizens and that's against our constitution. So they're having to resign. If they're in the lower house, they can go for a, a re-election. If they're in the Senate, they can't. They've got to wait till the next four years. So it's been absolute furor. So there's, the business of government has almost come to a grinding halt. It's a very thin majority that you know, Malcolm Turnbull's clinging on to and you know, he's on very you know, thin ice at the moment in terms of his own credibility and popularity. But despite that, the economy keeps moving on in a positive way. And that's because it's very diverse. We've got great minerals, great agriculture, great construction, huge migration growth. Everything is going right for Australia and continues to do so. But consumer sentiment is really at a low point right now. So you can see that's dipped under the 100, which is the basically happy. And that's because of all these problems going on. So imagine once these things get fixed up and the sentiment improves, then the economy becomes even more stronger. But it's a very much a bulletproof economy. Even in the global financial crisis, only one quarter of, of uh, you know, um, negative growth and then quickly into rebound. And that's just you know, why it's such a good place. In terms of cycles, just to put them up each year, I say Darwin is probably now well and truly evidenced in its next phase. Sydney, I believe, is on the cusp, in fact, maybe even in its negative growth phase. The population growth is the only thing stopping me putting it into the red line. You know, that population growth is so strong, it's going to support that market. So I don't think that the Sydney is in danger of falling off a cliff, as some um, predictors say, but that population growth needs to be monitored and see how it goes. Perth, I think, is a great opportunity. It's just waking up from bottom of the market phase. Brisbane and Melbourne are still very, very strong, and Adelaide kicks along. But you, as a constant warning for small apartments, we just please, please, please resist the temptation to buy small apartments anywhere in Australia. You know, they're going to be very low performing growth. They're going to be renting, but not high um, rent growth. So, you know, Sydney, be careful of. Melbourne's looking good. To show you how those numbers stack, you can see the weighted average in Australia for the last 12 months was 10.2%, which is pretty phenomenal. Sydney had a great year at 138 It had started to cool like we predicted, but the population growth you know, kicked in and took it back to a 13.8%. But the last two quarters, you can see, are on the decline. It's gone from 52 in December to 3% and 2.3 in June. And I expect to see that flatten out and maybe go into a little bit of contraction. Melbourne is uh, equal now with Sydney as the top performer, uh, largely because of that population growth, benefit of being the world's number one city. You can see Brisbane is doing modestly well, but will be a big benefactor as people from Sydney start heading up there. Adelaide is doing quite okay. It's a nice little you know, place with good value. Perth has stayed in negative territory, but I think it's now hit that bottom of the market, and I think that's going to be a very, very good investment zone over the next 18 months. So if you can get into the Perth market, highly recommended. And you can see there's Adelaide. 12.4% was phenomenal, and that's largely because of that theory I have about population. We saw the population growth in, in um, Hobart double. It went from 15 to 3%. You know, it's you know, the 3,000 people. It's phenomenal what that difference makes. If people come, particularly with money, that's the thing that supports markets. Darwin's in a little bit of trouble. Canberra's you know, fixing itself up. You can see, here's one of the key reasons I don't think Sydney and Melbourne have any real downside risk in, in terms of prices, and it's the vacancy factor. You can see 1.8% vacancy factor in Sydney is perhaps the lowest in the world. And hence, when you see that market is that tight, it's not surprising to see that the market will have stability. It has to slow its growth because it's becoming unaffordable, but it doesn't mean that the prices have to collapse either. You know, rental increases have been reason reasonable there, but you can see in the last quarter, both Sydney and Melbourne have not been able to achieve rental increases. They actually went backwards. And that again tells you that the cycle is changing where... You know, there's now enough supply that renters can say, look, I'm not willing to pay those higher rents and I'm not going to justify just because the prices are high. Brisbane at 2.8 is good. Perth at 7.3 is a very high vacancy, but that's starting to be chipped away. And in the market, you know, as long as you meet the market with your price expectation, you will rent your property out. But you just have to make sure it's presented well 
and happy. In Perth, we now do property management and we've got the lowest rate at 6.6. It's usually 9.35. So if you have a Perth property, let us look after it. Not only high quality uh, management, but also the least cost. You know. Now, if we look at the long term, we can see all the markets there over 15 years are always about the same growth. They're in that 6 to 8% range. Now, even with Sydney being such a, st a strong performer in the last year, it's still only averaged 15 years, 6.69% per year. <clears throat> the last five years is 13%. It's had a phenomenal rate. But people forget the five years before that wasn't that flash. Melbourne has had a great year, 9% over the last five years. It's still got some life in that market to bring the long-term average up. Brisbane, I think, is, is looking pretty good. Anywhere where it is b performing above the, na the average of 6 to 8% is more likely to slow down to come back to average. Anywhere performing under 6 to 8% is more likely to accelerate to meet the average. So I always like to buy in markets that are underperforming, such as Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide. Those markets are looking pretty good for me, and I'm pretty content in going into those as opportunity buys. Particularly Perth, because any time you see discounting, there's extra opportunity. Perhaps one big um, stat to finish off on is the difference in prices across Australia now. Now, this is perhaps the biggest you know, issue to me. If we look at Sydney prices, they're now 55% above the national average of 768000 that's a huge premium for being the major city. Now, you can see Melbourne, being the next biggest city, has a premium of 7% above the average. So that's about what you'd normally expect, 7 to 10%. But Sydney at 55 is telling you that it's probably got a little bit ahead of itself and there's not much growth potential in the next little while until the others catch up. But Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, you know, uh, Canberra to a lesser extent, Hobart, they're 30 to 40% under the average. Now, a key thing here is that 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted a high paying job, you had to go to Sydney. And hence why big money was there, big prices were there. But now, those big paying jobs are evenly spread around Australia into Melbourne, into Brisbane, into Perth, even into Hobart. And so you don't have to go to Sydney to get the big paying job. But even if you earn a bit less, if you're paying that much less for your house, your lifestyle is so much better. And that's why I think people are going to start moving from Sydney into Melbourne, into Brisbane, into Perth, into Adelaide, and that's going to have an improvement element on those markets. And it's just going to take the pressure out on Sydney and slow the growth, but hold the value. But that to me is one of the most compelling stats of the seminar. Finishing off, you know, I hope you've enjoyed all that. I hope that information has some sort of resonance for you. You need to be careful. But in summary, we've got to start getting together. You know, it's been a real problem in Australia over the last particularly two years and the last five that we are not having any respect for foreign investment, not as an expatriate, not as a foreign investor. You know, we are boosting the economy significantly. We are providing stable housing. We are having so much positive impact, yet they're not giving us any appreciation. In fact, the opposite. They're saying, well, they can afford it. Keep taking, keep taking. That's got to stop. You know, we've seen in the whole world that things have got strange. You know, Donald being the president, no one would have really thought that was possible, but it's there. And the things that are going on are just crazy. And I think this is the new norm. I don't think things will improve. I think they're going to get perhaps even stranger. You know, we seem to be tolerant of all these things beyond all comprehension. You know, we've also seen Mother Nature speaking out. I thought it was quite ironic that literally weeks after Donald Trump said that there's no such thing as climate change and the US was pulling out of the accord, that we had three multi-century you know, strength you know, um, hurricanes tear through the south of the US. We've seen you know, blizzards. We've seen you know, all sorts of you know, environmental issues come to the fore. And people still have denial that there's some impact going on with the climate. You know, it's a key, key component of what's going on in the future. And the good thing is, Australia has the least aggressive weather on the planet, the least, you know, um, worst winters, the most moderate, you know, summers, 
things are really, really good in Australia. And the rest of the world, I think, is weighing that up. Do you really want to be in a hurricane zone or would you like to live in a lovely place like Sydney? Do you want to be freezing and blizzarded in during your winter months or would you like to have a moderate you know, winter like Perth does? And I think that's going to be a big thing for Australia because people are figuring out that Australia is an incredible place to live. If you don't like high migration, then Australia is not going to be the place for you because we're going to have increased migration because people are going to want to live there. You know, everyone knows how wonderful it is. It's just being found out. It's a big thing. Our population growth is the key to our future. It's the key to our property market stability. It's the key to our economic stability. You know, we need that. So we can't slow it down in any way. But we have to make sure it remains the highest quality population. You know, 70, 80 percent of all migration to Australia is skilled or wealth migration. It's improving the pool. It's not disproving. So expect that to continue into the future. And I hope you understand that property investment does require thought and process. It can't be just by luck. You know, those survival tips to be awareness, selection, efficiency and togetherness, they're key elements of success. If you can put all those things together, you should be more profitable and above average returns. And that's what you want to achieve. And we need to stand together. We need to be heard. And we need you to help support the Apollo. So if you can get in, join as a member of the Association of Property Owners Living Abroad, that's going to add tremendous value to our ability to keep things normal and safe and get heard nationally. You glad to know we're finished with this presentation. I thank you very much for your time of joining us this, you know, in, in this time. Um, if you have any queries, any questions whatsoever, please email us at smats at smats.net. Of course, smats is there to assist you with your property finance, your Australian taxation requirements, you know, your property management and sales, foreign exchange, you know, and anything at all that you might need relating to your time abroad or in Australia. You know, thanks very much for your attendance. I look forward to re reviewing how we go with our predictions next year and seeing you, you know, next September, October. Good night.